Thank you, Fairview, for having me this morning. It's great to be here. I wish, uh, obviously, that it was in different circumstances, but we know that uh, Pastor Jim has been in good hands these past couple weeks and uh, hope that he will be back here in this spot again soon. One of the very interesting things about this disaster season of these past two months is over the course of 50 years, and we're celebrating 50 years of disaster response in Virginia Baptist life this year, and we've responded to about 72 uh, different disasters over those 50 years. Half of those have been in the last four years. I don't know if that's because I'm in the job or just a, a lucky byproduct. But in that time, we have had five people fill this position, Jim and I being two of them. And Lloyd Jackson was the first, and he passed away about two years ago. And Terry and Dean are the other two. So the four of us who are living have all served in some capacity over these past few weeks. And so it's been great to join these guys, uh, to have Jim back in the mix. Uh, as he had moved around to different churches, he had taken a step back for a season. Uh, but it's great to have him involved again, to have many of your folks from here at Fairview involved, and to be responding with us. At some point here in the next few weeks, we will cross the million-dollar mark for just this year. million dollars worth of volunteer labor and donated contributions going into communities affected by disasters. So it's certainly been uh, a busy season, uh, dare I say a record-breaking season, uh, a lot of significant storms, and one of the great opportunities that we have had is in responding to Hurricane Florence in neighboring North Carolina, they have invited us directly to help work there over the long haul. So what you saw on the screen at Jasper's house was tearing everything out to make sure uh, the floodwaters did not create mold challenges that would just multiply exponentially and get worse. But once it's all cleaned out, it has to be put back together. And so we'll be putting homes back together in Jones County and Beaufort County in North Carolina for probably at least a year, if not two, to come. And so um, I'm sure you will hear more about that and would love to have you join in that effort uh, in the long-term response to the hurricanes. Well, as you saw in, in Jasper's story, Jasper said there at the end, it's great to have churches who make this kind of effort part of their fellowship. And so for us in disaster response, we want to reach and make an impact, as uh, one of the volunteers said, on the person. It's not just about cleaning out the house. It's not just about sharing a meal. It's about the person. And a few years ago when I started in this role in disaster response, one of the first questions I got was, when are you going to have chaplaincy come back? Because Tammy George had started our disaster chaplaincy, and over time, the volunteers just kind of faded away. Some of them had career changes, and so they, they drifted out of the picture. And so we needed to reinvigorate this. And so through an interesting partnership, with Texas Baptist, we restarted disaster chaplaincy because we have that uh, focus and desire to reach each homeowner and each person affected by disaster. And so we sent some trainers to Texas in April of 2017. And in August of 2017, we hosted a training here in Virginia. And two weeks later, Hurricane Harvey hit. And we sent those Virginia volunteers who had been trained by trainers, who had been trained by Texas volunteers, right back to Texas to serve there. And so that opportunity is one of our newest to reach folks affected by disaster. And we told this hypothetical story that we knew was a reality, but we didn't have a, a real story. It was hypothetical. That what we wanted to do was give survivors of disaster a listening ear. We wanted them to be able to share their story, lay some of their burden on someone else. But in an instance like Jasper, Jasper can't go to his neighbor because his neighbor would have been flooded just the same. And so we needed to build the capacity and reach out in those communities. And one of the very first people our chaplain lead talked to in Texas after Hurricane Harvey was in a shelter, and he had lost everything. He had lost his house, he had lost his car because it had flooded, he had lost his job because his workplace had flooded and had to close down. 
And he laid all of this out for Kristen. And at the end of the conversation, he looked at her and he said, thank you so much for listening. For two weeks, I've been here at this shelter and I have not been able to tell anyone my story because I didn't want to burden them. They all have their own story. So this happens in disasters, in, in disaster-affected communities where there's been a hurricane or a flood, a uh, fire like in California right now, tornadoes, uh, like Jasper mentioned. Whatever region you're in, disasters can come. But disasters also come locally. They come to one person at a time in all sorts of instances. And so as we shift this morning from disaster response to looking at scripture for a few minutes, I want us to think about those just one person around us, our neighbor, our coworker, who may be going through something. Think about them as we look at these three parables from Jesus this morning. You know, it's interesting how similar we are to our friends. Have you ever thought about that? The people that we surround ourselves with are people who have common interests. We have a common shared experience together. There's something that brought us together to be friends. And if we look at each other, certainly there are personality differences. You got that friend that just gets on your nerves after a while because they're just different. Or maybe they get on your nerves because they're that much like you. But we tend to surround ourselves with people like us. And this happens in the workplace, too. You know, I've been doing some, some workplace consulting over the past few uh, months and years. And one of the things that we talk about is that you don't want your team to be all like you. You want your team to have a variety of voices and perspectives because that makes a stronger team. And so you look at something like Myers-Briggs or uh, the DISC profile or Five Voices or shifting over into to spiritual things, your spiritual gifts. And you want people, and we know in Scripture it says we want people with a variety of gifts because the body is made up of different parts. And so it's going against who we are and our inherent nature to find people like us for us to step outside of our comfort zone a little bit and find people who are not like us. But Jesus did this all the time. He flipped things upside down. The things that we inherently did or inherently thought about, Jesus said, you've heard it said. He said this, this phrase a lot. You've heard it said, but I say. You think this, but actually it's like this in God's kingdom. And so let's think about this as we look in Luke chapter 15 this morning. There are three parables he tells here, and we are going to make it through the whole uh, chapter, but I like this because Jesus talked in stories, and I love stories. So here are the three stories, and he introduces it with these two verses. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Catch that? Tax collectors who were not popular and notorious sinners. Sounds like the start of a Western or something. But these are the people who often came to hear Jesus teach. They wanted to listen to him. And this made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people. So the insiders didn't like that Jesus was with the outsiders. And this verse ends, even eating with them. One of the most, sacred's not the right word, but one of the most intimate settings of sitting down with somebody at a dining room type table, not even the dining room table, the kitchen table, or just around the center island, sitting down to have a meal. And he was doing this in such a way that the insiders didn't like that he was associating with the outsiders. So he, he sets this example, and they didn't like this. So because they didn't like this, he set out to tell three stories. So the first one, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? How many, anybody's shepherd in here? Okay, so we got to kind of shift our minds to the shepherd's reality, that this was their way of life. What will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one that's lost until he finds it? 
So he's got 100 sheep and one wanders away. But the sheep tend to stay together. So he doesn't have to worry as much about the 99, even though it's just one. One percent, one percent of his flock has left. But instead of sticking with just the 99 and being content with that, he goes after the lost one. And when he's found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders because he doesn't want to lose it again. And when he arrives, he will call his friends together, his friends and neighbors, saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. And so Jesus turns the tables back to them and says, you know this story. They knew it because shepherds were all over the place. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. You know, it can be overwhelming to think about the needs in our community, the needs that our friends and our coworkers have who are not part of a faith community. It can be overwhelming. But if we draw a comparison here, That 1% is important, and it's only 1%. We just have to go after the one. God's not saying, and Jesus isn't saying in this, to solve the whole problem. He's not saying, pen up your flock so you can keep them all together. He says, go after the one, and God is going to rejoice and celebrate when that one is found. And so then he reaches the end of that, and he says, but, you know, one story is probably not enough. Let me tell another one. So suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? So imagine there's no electricity. All you have is candle lamps. It's after dark, and you've lost a coin. And what they say is this coin was probably the same as one day's wages. So imagine working a whole day, getting back home, you lost the coin, it's fallen down probably on the ground somewhere, and you can't see anything. But that one day's wage is incredibly important. So one out of ten, we've gone from one out of a hundred to one out of ten, So the importance has gotten more significant. So she searches carefully. You can imagine a dusty dirt floor in that time period. Sweeping, dusting, carrying that lamp around, looking under things, searching frantically for that one coin. And when she finds it, she'll call in her neighbors and friends and say, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. So the same phrase, the same outcome in this story as in the first story. And then there's one more story, which we'll take the overview here, but it's the story of the lost son. So one sheep out of 100, one coin out of 10, one son out of two. So incredibly more important. The man had two sons, and the younger one said, I want my share of your estate now before you die. I don't want to wait for the inheritance. I just want to go now. And so a few days later, he packs it all up, moves off to a distant land, and squanders all of the money. He loses it all, the entire estate, gone. And when he finally comes to his senses, he realizes He's taking care of pigs, and even the pigs are eating better than he is. He says, you know what? I'm going to go back home and beg for forgiveness. And so he gets home and begs for forgiveness. And then we get this part where we're now talking about people. We're talking about two sons, two brothers, and you know how sibling rivalries can go. I put my brother through a wall one time. True story. I won't tell you how old I was, because that's more embarrassing than putting him through the wall. Sibling rivalries are fierce. And so you can imagine this one son who has diligently stood by his father's side and worked every day, every week, every month 
for his adult life while his brother went off and partied and squandered away the money and lost it all. And then the brother comes back and the dad throws a party for the lost son that he never threw for the son who stayed and worked hard. But it's kind of this upside down world that Jesus talks about. It's the upside down backwards perspective on life. That's not how we think about it, but it reminds us that God is calling us and Jesus tells us in these parables to go after the one, whether it's one of a hundred or one of 10 or one of two, we are called to go after them. So it doesn't matter if we invite these ones to worship or to a, a small group or to even pack a box with us. What matters is that we invite them. What matters is that we start a relationship with somebody, just like Jesus says to, to go after the one. If one of our neighbors is lonely, let's pursue them and let's invite them to overcome the loneliness by being a friend with us. If one of our neighbors is fighting the downward spiral of addiction, let's see what we can do to help them. If the neighbor is out of work, let's see what we can do to befriend them. If the neighbor's on the brink of divorce, let's connect with them. But in none of these do we have to fix it. We don't have to fix the problem that they're dealing with. We'll leave that to God and the opportunities and the invitations that will come in time. But what we can do is invite them into a relationship and into a connection with us. Let's be a church that goes after those ones. Not just the church at Fairview, but the church everywhere. And like I started in disaster response in telling that story, we want to go after the one. We want to go after the individuals who have been challenged. And we've heard stories after the tornadoes in Appomattox. A couple ended up divorcing because the stress of the disaster was just too much. And we want to help them. And people have lost jobs because businesses have closed. And so we want to see what we can do about helping to create resources in the community for them to find a new job. But most importantly, we want to invite them. And one of the opportunities that we're going to take in North Carolina is to invite the church, the local church there, because we can't do this from Virginia in a community in North Carolina. But we want to invite the church in eastern North Carolina that's already seen a resurgence in their community. They're seeing new people move in because these young families are identifying with and enjoying the quiet, small-town community where they are. And so we want to invite this church. And I saw uh, Gannon is going to be standing here next Sunday, and Gannon will probably say some of the exact same things. Hopefully he doesn't repeat me in talking about Luke 15. But one of the projects Gannon has worked on recently is dinner church. Just an opportunity to sit down at the dinner table. And so that's something we're going to invite this church in North Carolina to do. While we're there working on homes, to take the opportunity, to take the step after those just ones, just one person. One out of 100, one out of 10, one out of two, and invite them into a relationship so that they have an opportunity to know this upside-down world kind of Jesus and to join in, in what we know to be true and to let them experience that too. So as we close the message this morning, I want to invite you. I want to invite you to pray and ask God to lay a name on your heart. Lay a name on your heart of that just one person that you could have a conversation with this week. Someone you could reach out to, someone you could connect with, someone you could invite out for coffee or over for dinner, just to have a conversation with. 
And maybe this morning you feel like you are that just one. And you need to have someone reach out to you. And so if that's you, and you want to take a step forward in your journey with Jesus this morning, we'll pray for that too. So let's pray together this morning and ask God to lead us to that next step. God, we thank you for sending your son to earth. We thank you that we get to celebrate this season each year as we head towards Christmas to reflect and remember the gift that you sent to this earth in the form of your son. So God, as we are preparing to step back out into our world this week, into whatever we have ahead of us at home, at school, at work, in our neighborhood, God, show us one person we can connect with. Show us one person that you think we should be in relationship with. Show us one person that we can connect with to show them how much you love them. And God, for anyone here this morning who is standing here thinking about how to enter into a relationship with you, I ask that you will open their hearts and give them the courage to step out and share with someone this week about that decision they want to make in furthering their relationship with you.